Good morning, everyone. I'm Jake Light, one of the uh, first year Retina Fellows here. Uh, welcome to Evan Dune Conference for today, October 13th. We'll start off with case one, a 59-year-old female who was referred from our CPEC clinic uh, for retinal pigmentary changes, otherwise asymptomatic. Dr. Sivalingham, would you take us through it? Sure. So <clears throat> here we have a wide-field pseudocolor fundus photo of the right eye, Visions 2025. <clears throat> uh, media appears to be clear. Disc margin itself looks nice and sharp. Um, however, there does appear to be some um, peripapillary atrophy, potentially kind of a ring of hypopigmentation surrounding the disc. Um, vessels themselves, um, you know, supertemporally look normal in their course and caliber. However, attention is drawn to this kind of granular hypopigmentation surrounding what appears to be the veins, kind of superiorly in the nasal periphery and infrotemporally here. Um, and then there is some kind of, this kind of bone spicule-like hyperpigmentation out in the nasal periphery, as well as in the infrotemporal periphery. This appears to be kind of over overlying the vessel potentially. Um, and then kind of similar areas of hypopigmentation in the superior macula. Um, I don't see any hemorrhages. Um, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. And how about the left eye? Yeah, so similar pattern in the left eye visions 2025, media is clear, disc margin. Again, looks sharp, however, there is kind of this um, circumpapillary hype, ring of hypopigmentation, and then similar kind of granular um, hypopigmentation, again, following the veins. However, in this eye, there is kind of this more um, bone spicule-like hyperpigmentation out in the nasal periphery, um, as well as infrotemporally and suprotemporally. Um, Again, some involvement of this hypopigmentation in the macula. Um, I don't see any hemorrhages. Great. Okay, so we have um, fundus autofluorescence of the right eye. And here, interestingly, so you can see kind of this hypo autofluorescence correlating to that hypopigmentation that we saw in the color fundus photo. Again, following the veins. And then there kind of is this subtle halo of hyper autofluorescence um, here in the veins, kind of more proximally to the disc. Um, and then you do see kind of that subtle ring here out in the infratemporal periphery. Yep, and similar pattern here. Again, areas of um, hypo autofluorescence correlating to those hypo pigmented areas. And then again, we see this kind of subtle halo of hypo, hyper autofluorescence kind of at the uh, borders of the hype, hypo autofluorescence. And then maybe um, some kind of um, subtle hyper autofluorescence out in the temporal periphery. Agreed. Um, so we have an OCT horizontal scan through the right eye. Um, looking at the infrared image, you do kind of see um, that hyper, that area um, that we saw, the hyper um, pigmented areas kind of in the superior macula. And then looking at the vitreous, it looks clear. Looks like the hyloid is still attached. Maybe some mild vitreo macular traction or adhesion here. Um, nerve fiber layer looks normal. Inner retinal layers look um, well preserved. Good laminations and outer retina looks healthy. Choroid looks normal. Fairly consistent with a vision of 2025, you'd say? Yeah, I agree. Um, and then left eye, horizontal scan again. Um, Vitreous looks clear, hyloid again is visible, appears to be attached, inner retinal layers, inner retinal layers look good, outer retina 
looks good as well. Chloride looks normal. Okay, and then we have another horizontal scan, kind of more inferiorly in the macula. Um, looks like we are kind of taking a slice right through this vessel here. You can see that um, appears to be an artery right here. Um, and then we do see some disruption of the, looks like the ellipsoid zone and the ISOS junction, and maybe some attenuation of the RPE as well. You do see some increased transmittance through the choroid. Here we have IVFA, the right eye <coughs> at 30 seconds, venous laminar phase. Um, we do see this early hyperfluorescence, um, kind of in that speckled granular uh, pattern, um, similar to what we saw in the color fundus photo and the autofluorescence. Um, something that's this hyperfluorescence this early on would make maybe think of some type of window defect. Uh, but I'd need to see later frames to confirm. Mm -hmm. Yep, and here we are at 53 seconds. Again, persistence um, of this hyper, this kind of granular or speckled hyperfluorescence, again, following the veins, correlating exactly to those lesions that we saw um, in previous imaging. In a minute and 21 seconds, persistent hyperfluorescence. It doesn't really appear to be um, leaking. I would say just kind of persistent hyperfluorescence here. Yeah, still very much uh, respecting the borders that yeah. it started with. Yeah, I agree. Um, and similar here, left eye, two minutes and 34 seconds. Again, this hyperfluorescence um, correlating to those lesions we saw before. Um, notably, the disc, you know, we see the area of hyperfluorescence correlating to that kind of peripapillary atrophy, but we don't see any frank leakage. We don't see any leakage in the macula. And um, pretty stable appearance at four minutes and seven seconds. However, maybe out in the temporal periphery, we do see some late. Um, I guess you could call this staining, um, kind of some late, or sorry, leakage, I would say, some late leakage out in the far temporal periphery. Right, but interestingly, the lesions themselves don't appear to have yeah. much uh, Very associated stable. leakage. Yeah. Yeah, and similar appearance here at four minutes and 27 seconds in the left eye. Again, kind of stable appearance of those lesions we saw before. However, again, we do see this kind of late leakage out in the far temporal periphery. Thanks very much. So what is this? Yeah, so, you know, the pattern that I see kind of affecting the veins makes me think of things, you know, terms of phlebitis that could be affecting the veins. So, you know, I always think of things like TB, um, syphilis can typically affect the veins and the arteries. Um, sarcoid can cause a phlebitis as well. You know, there doesn't really seem to be that much active inflammation. I guess you could, you know, this could be kind of like an old burnt out um, viral retinitis, although it's a very, it wouldn't be like typical pattern for that. Um, and then kind of in terms of the more inflammatory um, etiologies, you can think of things like um, serpiginous, Although, you know, it, it does very much respect the, the veins, so that would be more atypical. Um, Azor can kind of have a similar pattern. Um, atypical RP, I guess, with those kind of bone spicule-like lesions, um, which is very right, Some sort of a degenerative or, or dystrophic sort yeah. of process. Good. You've touched... And um, everything you said is absolutely true in papillae um, infectious causes. But um, from the inherited retinal disease point of view, um, it has been reported by some, but not been um, shown by others to be associated with crumbs one. 
Um, all that for naught. <laughs> so um, this is PPCRA, pigmented uh, um, uh, per, uh, uh, paravenous um, um, peripheral chorioretinal atrophy, PPCRA. It's too early in the morning to remember what exactly that stands for. <laughs> oh, good. We want to hear it again. <laughs> uh, but um, um, yeah, it, it's 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 been. Uh, you have to like like you said, uh, Dr. Sivalingam, have to rule out the infectious um, causes um, and the inflammatory causes. But it has been associated with um, uh, a a specific gene. Um, in one or two papers, but others have not been able to replicate that, and that's CRUMS-1. Um, and CRUMS-1, CRB-1, um, uh, you would uh, uh, typically uh, can see cystoid macular edema, which the patient doesn't have. Um, you can see a Coats-like response, um, and you would expect um, some inner retinal um, uh, uh, disruption of the laminations, which you don't have either. So those things kind of go against it, but you would still want to rule out crumbs one. So Dr. Polito, you, so you called this pigmented paravenous chorioret chororetinal atrophy. Has it also been called in the literature paravenous RP? Uh, yes, that's another name. Yeah, um, and your description was so good along the veins, and that's what I recognize this as. But this is really important. Well, I think you've touched on exactly the things we were thinking of. Again, to your point, you have to at least consider some sort of inflammatory or infectious etiology, whether it be a burnt out retinitis or vasculitis or any of these other infectious or inflammatory etiologies, and then the dystrophies and degenerations are also on the list. Um, and PPRCA retinochroidal atrophy or chorioretinal atrophy, uh, we'll, we'll consider them uh, synonyms. Um, and then there are a couple of additional uh, entities, such as a helicoid and some atypical uh, cone rod or cone rod dystrophy or some sort of atypical geographic atrophy could also be considered. But I agree, I think this is a case of pigmented paravenous retinochroidal atrophy, or PPRCA. It was first described back in 1937 by Brown, uh, and it was actually in a 47-year-old male with alopecia areata. There have been numerous prior terminologies for this entity, including retinochoroiditis radiata, pseudoretinitis pigmentosa, chorioretinitis striata, and congenital pigmentation or melanosis of the retina. The leading hypothesis, which was put forward all the way back in 1973, suggested that the RPE is the primary site of the pathology, hence the choice to call it PPRCA instead of CRA, at least in some of the literature. Uh, and interestingly, the majority of case reports have been reported in male patients, though the reason for that is unclear. The etiology again, is also very unclear, but there are several hypotheses, one of which, which Dr. Polito mentioned, is that there may be a hereditary component with the uh, CRB1 association. Some think it may be developmental, as there has been reported an association with macular coloboma, possibly inflammatory. Some of the earliest case reports did do testing in those patients and found either positive syphilis or tuberculosis testing, though unclear if that was truly causative or simply a red herring. Or maybe some combination of all of the above. Uh, some authors in the literature suggest that this entity should be divided into two categories, one being primary PPRCA and the other being secondary or pseudo, that is when an inflammatory uh, or infectious insult leads to this sort of a phenotype. One such case of that that was reported, uh, interesting case where they actually followed over 20 years, a young 17-year-old female who developed vision loss in the left eye uh, initially and then uh, in the right eye about a week later, was found to have uh, retinal edema, though no actual uh, AC or vitreous cell, was treated with empiric IV steroids, though had a completely negative workup but over the next 20 years actually developed these paravenous pigment changes. 
So suggesting could this have been a case of secondary PPRCA where a clear inflammatory insult eventually can lead to this similar phenotype. Here are a couple of the other entities that I think we should keep on the differential as they oftentimes can mimic uh, the appearance of PPRCA. One is pericentral RP, which uh, tends to be much more uh, posterior than the classic uh, peripheral RP. Uh, this is an example of helicoid peripapillary choroidal degeneration, which, as you can see, does not actually follow the vascular distribution, but one could uh, speculate that it could have a, an appearance that might look like it follows the veins. Uh, angioid streaks, as well as serpiginous choroiditis. In our patient, uh, we did send syphilis testing, tuberculosis testing, and sarcoid studies in the form of a chest x-ray. Those were all negative, and as is typically done, aside from genetic testing, which is an interesting thought that we had not yet gotten in her, uh, would be to observe, as most of the case reports uh, suggest that this is a fairly stationary disease or only mildly progressive. All right, moving on to case two. Jose, quick question. So the case that you reported, is there in the OCT, uh, other than CME, is there anything else, autoretinal degeneration, interretinal degeneration? Um, yeah. So like I said, um, uh, crumbs one is, is, is important homeobox for the development of the laminations of the retina. So you lose interretinal laminations and you lose inner retinal laminations. Um, uh, uh, besides the CME, uh, you can have a Coats-like response in the periphery, and you can have loss of photoreceptors as well. So there's a very um, variable um, expressivity of the findings, but these are all classic findings that you look for and see if more than one exists um, uh, in, in union. Great. All right, we'll move on to case two. Dr. Shalai, we have a 46-year-old male. He's an inmate currently uh, with a blurry spot in his right eye now for two years. So we have a pseudocolor white field fundus photo of the right eye, uh, decreased central acuity, and this is the eye that the patient's symptomatic in. Um, media appears clear. The optic disc has very clear, sharp margins. The rims appear healthy. The renal vasculature appears to have a normal course and caliper extending to uh, the visualized periphery. I don't see any evidence of hemorrhage um, or perivascular changes in this patient. Uh, our attention is drawn to the macula, especially the central macula, there seems to be somewhat of a, a, a blunted reflex there. It's very hard to tell, though. Yeah, let me clarify it for you maybe a little bit. OK, so zoomed in image. And there are some pigmentary changes here in the central macula, possibly in the uh, infronasal macula as well difficult to tell if there's uh, any associated subretinal lesion or fluid associated with that. Um, hard to tell if the color appears consistent with a hemorrhage or this could be potentially serous. Yeah, I'll say on a clinical exam, there was no evidence for hemorrhage. Same imaging modality of the left eye. Central acuity is intact. Uh, Media appears clear, disc clear margins, nice healthy rims, vasculature normal course and caliber. Um, here we don't have as distinct of uh, a change in the macula, though that there may be some pigmentary changes here as well. And also our attention is drawn, sure. sorry, sure. just noted that. Um, in the supratemporal periphery, there appears to be some um, pigmentary changes, also maybe a choreoretinal scar. Anything so notable the, in the macula? Yeah, zoomed in image, it definitely is more clear than the previous, uh, than the other eye, so less of a blunted reflex, and the central acuity is intact, so 
I would be inclined to say this is more normal than the other eye. Maybe some color changes here inferiorly. I'm not sure if that's real or not. Uh, yes, they are. We've had several uh, images where there are these punctate foci that could be mistaken for Holland horse plaque, but you see they're in the exact same spot in the left eye as they are in the right eye. White field found the sort of fluorescence of the right eye. Uh, our attention is drawn to the hyperfluorescence that we see in the macula, fairly asymmetric, more hyperfluorescent in the inferior compared to the superior macula. In addition, there appears to be an extension going inferiorly, um, a guttering effect to the hyperautofluorescence that we see here. And uh, in the central macula, we see some punctate foci of relative hypoautofluorescence corresponding to those pigmentary changes we were seeing earlier on. Excellent. Same imaging modality of the left eye. We have a more normal um, autofluorescence appearance of the uh, macula here and some corresponding autofluorescence changes to that choreoretinal scar we were noting in the temporal periphery. We have a raster uh, horizontal OCT going through the fovea in the right eye. On the infrared image, we see have more enhanced visualization of those punctate changes that we were seeing in the central macula. Uh, I could argue there are some changes here in nasally that we have also were suspicious for pigmentary changes. Maybe even supranasally, there may be some as well. Moving over to the actual B scan, the vitreous appears to be optically clear. Uh, the choroid, um, it's looking, trying to find the posterior margin of it. I would argue this may be a little thickened um, choroid relative to the thickness of the retina. And our attention is drawn to this sloped, blunted um, contour of the fovea, which may be related to the uh, changes in the outer retinal laminations that we have here. Notably, the uh, RPE appears to be uh, thickened in some foci centrally, maybe some thinning as well. Uh, there appears to be loss of uh, ellipsoid zone definition and interdigitation zone definition in the center, as well as what appears to be some outer retinal cavitation, I would call, rather than subretinal fluid uh, in the center here. Yeah, excellent description. You had mentioned the, the core right here is an EDI. Okay, so EDI image, uh, better visualization of the posterior aspect of the choroid, and it does appear thick relative to the thickness of the retina here. Uh, no disc edema here. The hyaloid seems to be uh, attached. So sim similar imaging modality in the left eye. On the infrared image, uh, there may actually be some changes here in the inferior macula as well, though this B scan isn't going through it necessarily. Um, vitreous optically clear, choroid also may have that similar thickened appearance to it, though the retinal lamina laminations and foveal contour appear more normal in this eye. EDI image. Um, Again, redemonstrating that inferior macular change in the infrared image and uh, a thickened appearance to the choroid as well. Okay, so we do have the B scan now going through that area that we were suspicious for, and it does seem to correspond to uh, a small uh, pigment epithelial detachment there. Thoughts about this one? So, um, so it seems like now bilateral involvement, but predominantly right eye, outer retinal involvement. Um, I would inquire about trauma in this patient. Something like blunt trauma, commotional retina would be on my differential. Um, diseases in the spectrum of pachychoroid um, would be on my differential. Central serous retinopathy, especially uh, the chronic form, could definitely cause these changes, even the changes to the fellow eye as well. Uh, when I think about that polypoidal, it is also in the differential. Um, along those lines, uh, I would inquire about other causes of serous detachments like uh, hypertension, systemic hypertension, namely, which and chronically 
if it has caused serous detachment, could cause these sort of outer retinal changes. So I would inquire about hypertension as well. Some medications uh, that we've, I think, talked about previously to um, MEK inhibitors, uh, checkpoint inhibitors, uh, erectile dysfunction medications could acutely cause serous detachments that could eventually lead to these outer retinal changes. In the um, inflammatory infectious category, something like VKH, sympathetic ophthalmia, um, though this patient doesn't seem to have other um, intraocular inflammation sequelae per se. Uh, infectious diseases with pigmented retinochoroidal lesions, toxoplasmosis mm -hmm. would be on my differential. Um, and uh, in terms of retinal degenerations involving the central macula, something uh, like a cone dystrophy, I would be thinking about though is it is fairly asymmetric in this patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a very uh, comprehensive list of ideas, more extensive than I think I came up with. Um, central serous was, I think, top of the list, especially given that buzzword you said with the guttering. Uh, but I agree, I mean, some sort of retinal vascular disease, a, a vein occlusion or chronic hypertension, dystrophies, absolutely, or the medications you mentioned, like a MEK inhibitor or sildenafil, um, a couple other things that this, this patient doesn't seem to have but could also cause uh, you know, subtle subretinal changes, at least in the chronic uh, term, things like optic disc pit, uh, PPCV, and then some of the posterior uveitides, uh, some of which you mentioned. So given the guttering in this patient, uh, we felt that this was most likely a case of chronic central serous chorioretinopathy, in particular given the PED noted in the other eye as well, and the uh, thickened choroid. Uh, you know, the, the terminology of acute versus chronic is typically based upon the time to subretinal fluid resolution. Some uh, people in the literature have suggested that the three to four month time period is what should separate acute from chronic in terms of timing. Um, it is sometimes, in particular when you do not see any intraretinal or subretinal fluid, referred to as diffuse retinal pigment epitheliopathy, the idea that this has been going on for some time and you're seeing the long-term sequelae of the active exudation. Severe vision loss, defined as 2200 or worse, and the literature has been reported ranging from 5 to 12.8 percent of cases of chronic uh, central serous. So clearly does carry some visual morbidity to it, even though we in clinic oftentimes think of central serous as maybe a fairly benign, self-remitting sort of condition. Uh, and there have been studies in the literature that just demonstrate how poor quality of life uh, people with this condition will report when you uh, present them with a quality of life uh, survey. The classic biomarkers for central serous include uh, age with the highest uh, predilection for roughly the 30s to 40s. Uh, male, much more than female in the literature, it's been reported as a 1.7, even as high as 9, or essentially 10 times higher uh, male to female ratio. Uh, the exogenous or endogenous corticosteroid effect has uh, also been reported again and again. Psychological stressors and personality type have also been implicated. Sleep disturbance and uh, possibly that related to obstructive sleep apnea. Pregnancy. And there has also been some reports that maybe some genetic loci are associated with, with CSR, uh, in particular the complement factor H uh, locus. In our patient, I would say he has several of these. Age. Uh, sex as well as being an inmate, I suspect probably subject to some sort of psychological stressors on a fairly regular basis. Maybe sleep disturbance as well, though we didn't get into uh, to that conversation when, uh, when I saw him. This just brings up the point, though, that there are many conditions that can either look like central serous or central serous can look like many other conditions. This was an interesting review that was published uh, just in 2019 that looked to kind of tease through that a bit, breaking down some of the masqueraders into several categories, including choroidal vascular disease, inflammatory disease, retinal vascular disease, so-called anatomic abnormalities, 
and then kind of a catch-all others category. And I'm just going to go through these uh, briefly. They provided this interesting flow chart uh, that one can use at their leisure if they, if they so choose uh, when they're trying to find out what is this that I'm dealing with. If you have associated hemorrhage, you might be more uh, apt to think that this is some sort of a retinal vascular disease, whether RAP or a, a retinal vascular occlusion. Or IJFT is like a MACTEL, idiopathic juxtafoveal um, telangiectasia spectrum. Whereas if it's subretinal, you might be thinking more of a, a choroidal neovascularization process, polypoidal, uh, or again, possibly a RAP lesion. If you assess the optic disc and find it to be abnormal, uh, then you can consider potential uh, optic disc pit if there is uh, clearly an anatomic abnormality there. Or if there's disc edema, it might uh, lead you to think more of an inflammatory etiology for this. Assessment of the retinal periphery, again, if abnormal, might raise some of a uh, question of some of these other uh, entities, such as the bestrophenopathies, B-dump, if there's melanocytic proliferation, uvula effusion syndrome, and some of the white dot syndromes. And if there's an exudative RD, while again, none of these rule out CSCR, they might make you think more about uvula effusion, BKH, or maybe even choroidal tumor. <clears throat> So question I'll pose to the attendings in the audience, in your estimation, if you see a patient like this, you suspect CSCR, when do you go down the rabbit hole of a really extensive workup and what do you look for? Or do we typically call this CSCR, observe and see how they do? The most common atypical cases, we were just talking about it during a conference uh, this past week, but. Uh, personally, it will be older patients, uh, female, and multifocal, and uh, I'll be looking for uh, uh, endogenous uh, cortisol elevation, which at four ACTH levels and uh, twenty-four hour urine cortisol. Yeah, you would suspect that you would want to get a cortisol if it's not resolving, you know. And I, I we've had a couple of cases here at Wills. But I, I have to give comments from the other side of the railroad tracks. We see patients who've been followed with central serous retinopathy who are later detected to have an underlying tumor. They can have guttering. They can have chronic subretinal fluid with photoreceptor loss. So I do think a good uh, OCT to rule out an underlying choroidal tumor is really critical here, especially if it's a, a unilateral CSCR with uh, the choroidal thickness uh, not too great. Can you go back to the quite extensive um, algorithm? And I, you know, I think this algorithm should be re-explored um, by um, by putting uh, SRF at the macula, and after that, putting um, findings of OCT, um, because it kind of throws out a lot of these things. Um, so um, the OCT showing the pachychoroid on both sides um, pushes you far away from some of these other possibilities. And then, you know, um, I like ICGs because ICGs help you with um, uh, the, the, uh, a strong mimicker um, is polypoidal, and ICG can help you distinguish polypoidal from um, uh, from uh, pachychoroid kind of disease. Great, excellent. Any other final thoughts? All right, thank you. So if not, we'll move on to our final case of the morning. Dr. Sivalingam, we have a 53-year-old male who was sent to the Wills ED from an outside provider for acute vision loss in his right eye, pain, and found to have angle closure with uh, IOP in the 50s. <clears throat> so we have a what appears to be a wide field pseudo pseudocolor from this photo of the I'm assuming the right eye. It is the right eye. Honestly, yes. hard to tell. Um, light perception, vision. Media appears rather hazy. Um, can't even really visualize the disc margin. I think this is the disc here. Um, also very hard to make out the vasculature. 
attention is immediately drawn to this kind of dome-shaped elevation um, over here, and then kind of these retinal folds over here, what would be the temporal periphery. Um, so likely some type of subretinal fluid. Hard to say whether this is kind of serous. Um, and then over here, where we see this dome shape elevation, this me, me, would make me suspicious for some type of um, choroidal detachment. Hard to say if it's serous, again, or hemorrhagic. Um, and then you kind of here in the posterior pole, unclear if this is hemorrhage or kind of diffuse um, pigmentary changes. Um, and then he, up here, superiorly almost looks like hemorrhage as well. So we did get a ultrasound to try to clarify some of this. Perfect, so B-scan ultrasound of the right eye um, and you see this kind of scalloped um, choroidal, likely choroidal detachment with kind of this um, hyperechoic um, signal here, which would make me suspicious for hemorrhage. Obviously, you can't rule out um, some type of diffuse underlying mass. Um, but then interestingly here, you see kind of this clearing um, where it's more hypoechoic posteriorly. Um, sclera and choroid look I mean, sorry, the sclera here looks okay. Hard to say if there is thickening here or not. And this is when you want to do the ultrasound yourself because you want to look at this area and see if you can see any spontaneous vascular pulsations. If you see what looks like pulsations, it could be melanoma. If you see no pulsations, then it's probably blood. Yeah, and I guess dynamic B scan would be helpful as well to see if there is any fluid shifting. Um, or any layering of this fluid here. Mm -hmm. So um, left eye, vision is 20-20. Uh, media appears clear. Disc margin is crisp. Um, vasculature, um, maybe somewhat attenuated inferiorly, um, especially in the temporal periphery here. Um, and then attention is drawn to these multifocal, what appear to be intraretinal hemorrhages, kind of in a blot-shaped appearance um, throughout the posterior pole, as well as the mid-periphery. Um, looks like some of them have a white core, almost uh, reminiscent of a Roth spot. Um, and then this looks like white without pressure um, in the periphery, almost 360 degrees. Um, I don't know if this is um, kind of an attenuated blood vessel here or some type of sheathing. It looks like an artery. Um, oh. I think you've hit all of the uh, important findings. And then uh, fundus autofluorescence of the left eye. Um, you see um, kind of hypo autofluorescence correlating to those areas of hemorrhage. Um, and then, you know, macula kind of has that overall normal kind of subtle hyper autofluorescence, but again, <coughs> hypo autofluorescence in those areas of hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. um, and then OCT, horizontal scan through the left eye. Um, kind of redemonstration of those hemorrhages in the infrared image here. Um, vitreous appears clear. Um, kind of an overall, you know, you know, this foveal contour maybe is a little bit blunted. Um, and can the overall appearance of the retina maybe a little bit thin here, nerve fiber layer, um, nasally, you know, maybe a little bit thin. Um, but overall, good preservation of the retinal um, inner retinal laminations here nasally and outer retina nasally looks good. However, attention is drawn um, to these kind of cystic changes in the um, inner retina um, with overlying loss of the inner retinal laminations. Um, outer retina, you know, here looks relatively well preserved. Uh, maybe some loss here, although I don't know if that's just artifact from these cystic changes overlying. And then choroid, 
looks relatively okay. What do you think this might be? Yeah, so, you know, with those hemorrhages with the um, white core, it makes me think of a raw spot. So, you know, things you would definitely want to think of, some type of um, infectious etiology, um, like endocarditis, anemia, thrombocytopenia. Um, you can see this in leukemic retinopathy, certainly. Um, renal dysfunction can cause this. Um, I'd want to know, you know, with the findings in the right eye, I'd want to know if there's any some side of uh, any sort of trauma recently, um, or if he's on any sort of blood thinners. Um, yeah, those would be the main things. So, like a CBC with a diff would be a good place to start, and mm -hmm. kind of, I'd like to know more about his um, past medical history. Absolutely. So yes, there's uh, n numerous things that could, in theory, present similar to this anticoagulation, uh, anemia, thrombocytopenia, like you mentioned, a typical uh, to see a retinal vein occlusion do this, uh, hypertensive emergency, as you mentioned, renal dysfunction, sepsis or endocarditis, though the patient was otherwise well appearing and didn't seem uh, acutely in distress, and then trauma, leukemia, and unlikely but diabetic retinopathy, possibly. So you had already touched on some of this, and in the interest of time, I'll just kind of go through some of the additional history we did get from him. Uh, he does have diabetes. He does have hypertension. He is in end-stage renal disease and is actually on hemodialysis three days a week. He has uh, coronary artery disease as well as uh, heart failure. He's a former smoker, quit back in 2004. He does have a history of hypertensive urgency documented uh, with an end STEMI in 2019. He is on aspirin, 81, baby aspirin, but no current anticoagulation. Uh, he's on hypertensive meds, heart failure meds, insulin, and a statin. He denies any ocular trauma, no recent ocular surgery, glaucoma surgery, cataract surgery, anything of that nature, uh, and denies any personal or family history of malignancy or underlying blood dyscrasia. So additional data from a laboratory perspective was obtained. Uh, vitals, just to make sure this wasn't an acute hypertensive emergency, and it was not. Blood pressure was 130 over 89. Uh, no septic uh, or uh, SERS criteria were met here. His CBC did show uh, mildly reduced hemoglobin and hematocrit, and platelets uh, were borderline low, but certainly not to the level where you would expect spontaneous bleeding, which is usually more in the 10,000 or lower range. His BMP was significant for elevated BUN and significantly elevated creatinine to 8.5. And coagulation studies did show a borderline elevated PTT and PT, though not markedly so. So we felt pretty strongly that this was likely related to his underlying renal disease, given the fact that we were essentially able to rule out the other etiologies uh, by history and, and limited laboratory evaluation. Um, and it's known that patients with ESRD, especially those on dialysis, can have an inherent bleeding disorder. There are intrinsic platelet abnormalities in which the secreted factors from platelets are known to be reduced in patients with ESRD. There is poor von Willebrand and fibrinogen binding uh, that's also been demonstrated uh, in these patients. Anemia itself is sometimes thought to re uh, cause less platelet marginalization, the idea being if there's less red blood cells in the bloodstream that platelets are more likely to be in the center of the lumen as opposed to marginalized to the side and thus maybe less available uh, to uh, stop you know, minor ruptures in, in vessel walls. Uh, there's the thought that there's just an impaired clearance of metabolites from other medications that uh, don't normally affect uh, coagulation, but in higher quantities, if the, ren if the renal uh, uh, system is unable to excrete them, may uh, result in, in elevated levels. And then dialysis itself, you know, there is oftentimes use of anticoagulation uh, medications to clear the tubing. Uh, heparin is used uh, during the procedure. Uh, it's also thought that there can be degranulation of platelets as they pass through the dialysis uh, machine, uh, which may mean that there's less granulation, less factors available to be used when the platelets are returned uh, to the body.
Cases somewhat similar to this have been reported. That is spontaneous, you know, suprachoroidal hemorrhages in a patient undergoing hemodialysis. This case from 2007 was actually occurred in the setting of the use of TPA to clear the a clot within the dialysis line. Unclear if that was just uh, related to that specifically or more so related to the patient's underlying coagulopathy. Uh, but this is an entity that's been seen before. And you can see even in this patient, there are a couple of Roth spots uh, in, the, uh, in the fundus uh, outside of the area of the choroidal detachment. So our patient was treated with uh, topical uh, antihypertensives, COSOP, Ramonidine. He was put on Predforte, QID, and atropine, uh, essentially to treat this uh, choroidal hemorrhage. Uh, unfortunately, though, he uh, went on to uh, NLP vision, and so the eye, unfortunately, at this point is uh, in comfort care. So the chamber was shallow. Is that why the pressure was high? Yes. Correct. You know, I, I, I totally agree with you, but um, I would do a D-dimer, and I would look at his valves because you don't want to miss that. And he's on hemodialysis, he's had heart failure, you know, he's a setup to having um, subacute endocarditis, and he can die from that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the chances are low, but it's rel it's relatively easy to do, I'd want to rule that out. All right. Thank you very much, everyone.